Hello. This talk was originally presented at the Independent Entrepreneurs Council April 2012 Breakfast Seminar. Today you will see the results of the work of two guest speakers. Since uh, patent attorney Tracy Jong is not here, I, Richard Blasey, will narrate the talk. Today's topic is five common mistakes in managing your intellectual property that will cost you time and money and could put you out of business. These five mistakes are not the only ones that an intellectual property owner might make, but they are common and all too often overlooked. As consultants, our businesses rely on innovative companies and entrepreneurs to be successful. Strong companies produce new technology that we can help patent, license, and commercialize. The local economy in Rochester is infused and strengthened with growing businesses in the area. Rochester has long been one of the nation's hubs of innovation, with companies such as Xerox, Bausch & Lomb, and Konak, and Corning. RIT and the University of Rochester's medical research facilities have spun off many startup companies. Working with these companies, we often encounter practices that weaken the IP portfolios of some businesses. To better understand how we can help our clients, we've undertaken a study of common practices that are problematic and are sharing this information with you at no cost. We hope you, you will learn something valuable today and leave with some action items as to how you can protect your valuable resources or identify some previously unrealized income streams for your business. Many companies decide that if they choose not to patent their invention or feel that they have not invented something patentable, that they can ignore the patents of others. This can be a very big mistake. If your invention succeeds in the marketplace, others will become aware of it. If one of those others is someone who owns a patent covering something like your invention, you may get a very unpleasant surprise in the form of a letter from an attorney such as the one shown above. There are individuals called patent trolls who even use this as a business strategy. The owner of this other patent in a dispute has the power to tie you into legal knots in court, cost you a fortune in attorney's fees, and even shut your, down your production with an injunction, as BlackBerry owner Research in Motion learned to its dismay. An example of patent lawsuit costs, Matt and Ma lists the top 10 50 patent cases since 1980. Settlements range from $43 million to $925 million. A simple patent search at low cost will give you an idea of the surrounding prior art patents in the same area as your invention. While you can do a patent search yourself, unless you're an expert, you may miss important points of prior art, so consulting a skilled professional is well worth it. Infringement litigation is not something that just happens to others. It's a real risk. Legal opinions may seem expensive, but when compared with the costs of litigation, they're a wise investment and a way to maintain control over a string legal budget. Legal fees increases outpace inflation. Infringement lawsuits, which are in addition to legal fees, can be in the millions. In 2009, the national average legal fees in an infringement action ranged from more than a half a million to more than $5 million. A few thousand dollars for some insurance against such risk is really a good use of your money. Most people are surprised to learn that a patent does not give you the right to make or use an invention. It just means that you can prevent others from doing so. It's possible that there is another patent that is broader than yours that prevents you from practicing your invention. It's possible that using your invention would induce someone else to violate another patent along the way. It's possible that practicing your invention violates a contractual non-compete or obligation to assign the invention to an employer, university, or joint venture partner. Maybe you did not get FDA approval or are violating national security laws. Maybe the research facility or government have some rights if grants or public funds were used along the way. There are many situations where patent holders cannot commercialize an idea. To be sure you can profit from your investment in a product or service, you should consider a clearance opinion. Be sure that you can make the device without violating patents. You can sell it where you plan to market it. You can freely use the brand names you're contemplating and in the various markets. It is far less expensive to design around a problem before production begins rather than to go through a recall or an infringement claim. If a license is needed from another patent holder for proprietary technology, your negotiating position is much stronger at the outset when the opportunity to make money is the inducement for the cooperation. Negotiating a license to avoid an infringement suit after a problem has been incurred is a weak position and you will not fare as well in this defensive position. As the old adage goes, prevention and maintenance are less costly than repairs. 
Mistake number two, ignoring licensing opportunities. Your patent covers whatever is encompassed by its claims. Often the patent coverage, which is the blue circle here, is much larger than what you're actually using the patent to protect, the red circle. So for example, if you make green widgets and write a, a general patent covering all kinds of widgets, you can have the power to control the market for widgets of other colors than green. If another company wants to market a red widget, you can execute a limited license to your patent, allowing them to do so. The extra revenue from this patent license is like sleep money, money you earn for doing nothing extra, excluding any legal costs in drafting the license. If you ignore those possibilities, it's like throwing away cash. Our ITTR patent brokerage can help you find companies that may be interested in licensing your patent. One service that Tracy Jong provides is an intellectual property audit. In this type of audit, the business assets are inventoried. A study is conducted to determine what processes, devices, compositions, trade names, and written materials you may be using that are proprietary and have some commercial value. Analysis is made to determine the best method of protecting each asset, and an economic cost-benefit analysis is undertaken to determine whether it is economical to take such steps. She often uncovers technology that no one realized was patentable or that should be subject to trade secret protection. She uncovers assets that can be pledged as collateral to investors and lenders. She provides ways to protect your market niche from being employed by a copycat or competitor who did not invest in developing the technology and has significant cost advantages over you. She helps you recoup your investment by protecting the assets that you have in-house and form your market advantage. She helps you implement a protection strategy with a compliance manual that is used by company managers and human resources during day-to-day -day processes such as hiring and termination of employees. It is important to have a strategy before you enter license agreements. Consider all the ways your technology might be used. Can it be used in other fields? Can it be used by other companies in other places that will not compete with your markets? This mailbox money can help you recoup the extraordinary R&D investment in new technologies. To take advantage of these opportunities, you can't use just the one-size-fits-all license that you download from the Internet that gives you exclusive global rights to the licensee. This prevents you from taking advantage of other revenue sources that the licenses would not be exploiting. You need to customize your strategy and licenses to suit the particular circumstances of your technology and the particular distribution model for each key player. It's important to work out in advance the rules for who will own any improvements of the technology developed by the licensees who are using it. Absent a written agreement, you may lose the rights to important aspects of your own technology. Just a reminder that patents can be valid for 14 to 20 years. That's a long time to earn some licensing revenues. Don't be short-sighted and fail to consider these opportunities. Use your licensing revenue to offset the cost of the regular maintenance fees for your patent and to fund continuing R&D efforts. Many businesses have increased revenues at the end of the term of their license investment in manufacturing and marketing, which has been recouped by the licensee. It is important to keep in mind that the patent maintenance fees may be due, and these generally increase the, lo increase the longer the patent is enforced. Even if you are no longer using a patented technology, it may have value to other businesses. You can sell it or license it to cover your patent maintenance costs. There is an increasing use of abandonment to avoid them, particularly with clients who have large portfolios. Whether to abandon something that might or might be sold, in our case in the middle of negotiations, is a big issue for many. Licensing revenues are not the whole story. There are other factors that should be considered. Sometimes patents offer a perception that far outweighs their investment. Being perceived as high-tech, state-of-the-art, and market leadership trendsetter has great advertising value. The patent application is not made public by the patent office for the first 18 months, so you have a first-to-market advantage. If you're willing to waive certain rights, you can even request that your application not be published until after the patent is granted. Bragging rights about patented technology have marketing value that exceeds their legal costs. The proper use of patents and licenses can also be a strategic way to maintain your market share and consumer demand for the product. You can benefit from improvements by downstream licenses and suppliers. You can create new markets for accessories and product improvements. Look at the products like iPhone, iPad, and iPod. There are accessories and applications that keep the product relevant and customers coming back for more. The devices have not been placed out of the market trend by newer products from competitors. The consumer investment in accessories and apps keeps them from switching devices frequently. 
Bill Gates once said that the main assets of Microsoft walked out the door at 5 p.m. Valuable inventions can go right out the door with those workers. The ideas in their heads that are never patented and those projects that they worked on while at your company may later be patented by competitors. Christine Comerford tells this story. Two key engineers had quit a company and decided to create a competitive product. This despite the fact that the engineers had assigned a employment contract stating that whatever they developed was the company's property. Yet they conveniently closed, chose to forget this. Years later, those same two engineers, who by now had raised millions of dollars in financing, had the nerve to lob lawsuits at the company they had left, claiming patent infringement. This company was lucky. They had executed an agreement with their former employees. If they had not, the company could have spent years and all their reserve cash mired in lawsuits. The company in question had taken the important and minimal step of executing a patent assignment agreement. However, they had not taken the other step of collecting the inventions from the employees while they were still at the company. In that case, the patent assignment document would clearly have indicated the company owned these inventions. Finding and documenting inventions, even if you don't file the patent applications on them, is an important part of strong intellectual property strategy. That's something we can help you with. Many employers are surprised to learn that they can pay their employees to develop an invention with company time and company resources, but without a written agreement to assign the invention or a written company policy requiring assignment of all invention by employees, the employee still owns the invention. All the company may be able to get is shop rights in the form of a royalty-free, non-exclusive license. The employee can still license the invention to competitors or require that you buy it from them. This is generally not what the company had planned when it hired the employee, I'm sure. A simple document avoids this situation. The same rules apply for consultants and contractors, such as software developers or outside engineers. Joint inventors have no obligation to share profits. They can license without your knowledge or in consent and keep all the profits. This seems morally reprehensible, but it is an important thing to understand. It's like owning a joint bank account. Either owner can clean out the account and does not have to split the money with the other account holder. It's what we call, in law, an undivided interest in the whole. This is not as uncommon as you might imagine. Imagine one inventor does not want to share in the expenses, but is right there to share in the profits. You have no way to legally force them to pay you back for legal fees, maintenance fees, and other costs. Tracy often sees it when there's an infringement situation. Rather than pay a royalty, they approach the other inventor and get a license from them for some low price, preventing the inventor from suing them. She had that, an example of that just, just recently in a case. And again, the other inventor had no obligation to share. What about the case when one inventor dies or gets divorced? You can just imagine what situations arise between those left behind. What if your joint venturer all of a sudden gets into bed with your competitor? Life is about what have you done for me lately? There are very different sets of rights out there. One is the so-called secrecy agreement or non-disclosure agreement or confidentiality agreement. Many words are used for the same general document. When you have an NDA, the other person is prevented from telling anyone about your secrets. But what about using them to design around you? What about using them to your competitive disadvantage? What about indirectly helping a third party to your disadvantage? While these are separate legal documents, they are often coupled together into uh, combined non-use or competitive components with secrecy agreements. It's often more important that the other side doesn't use it than to keep a secret. Often they are in the best position to use it themselves. They are, they are after all, often a manufacturer or designer. They have the capability to leave you out and proceed to compete with you. There are also complex arrangements in multi-party systems that is when there are several different key players. This often comes up in software arrangements. Tracy has one set of rights with a software designer and another with an end user. Thus, often you need a different agreement for different situations, ones that address the risks of each situation. While you don't have to patent your inventions, you do have to protect them. If you don't, you face another challenge. Someone can patent something you invented and keep you from practicing it. Suppose your research department comes up with a new idea that for whatever reason you decide not to patent. You put it on the shelf. Later you decide to commercialize it. Meanwhile, your competitor, represented here by Dr. Evil, has already been granted a patent on the same idea. Too bad.